This service which you are viewing today is recorded in advance. It's actually recorded on Tuesday morning. But in the second half of August, we're going to begin a live streaming, which means that the service will be broadcast live from the church on a Sunday morning. And you will be able to view it, if you wish, simultaneously as it happens in church. You will still be able to view it later on in a recorded forum. But we need people in St Paul's who would be willing to operate the live streaming system. So far, we've had seven volunteers. Ideally, we would like ten because that would allow people to do it only once in five weeks and it would accommodate the holidays that people may wish. So if you think that you would be interested in live streaming, please get in touch with Elizabeth Alexander, our session clerk. Thank you. Welcome to this service for Sunday, the 25th of July. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn today is 160, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Let us pray. O God, our Father, we praise you for you created our whole vast universe and you now rule over it. We praise you for sending us your Son, our Lord Jesus, to take upon himself the world's sin and to remove our fear and our guilt. We praise you for sending us also the Holy Spirit to be our guide and our hope, and to build us up in fellowship, knowledge, and love. Lord God, we acknowledge that your light always exposes the extent of our darkness, and your faithfulness is the measure of our disloyalty. When we recollect your forgiving love, we realize the ugly hardness of our hearts is revealed. 
We claim you joyfully as our Father, but we do not deserve a place within your family, for we make up rules to suit ourselves and we trade on your forgiving nature. For the ways in which our lives have worked against your purpose and for all the hope you have had for us which we have not fulfilled, we ask you, Lord, to pardon us. O God, we ask you to raise us up by the strength of your Holy Spirit that we may fulfill our calling as your people. Help us to approach all that we do in this coming week with your values and with your integrity. Take from us all self-centeredness, our anxiety, our false pride, our defensiveness, and help us to love others in the knowledge of being loved by you, to serve others, remembering the example of Jesus who lived as a servant among human beings. May your spirit, the spirit of truth and wisdom and power, help us to use our lives as you would have us use them. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, and in the words which he taught his disciples of old, we further pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 189, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. reading today will be done for us by Mrs. Lynn Tom, who is an elder at St. Paul's. The passage which she will read is Acts chapter 9, 
reading from verse 1 to verse 9. In the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked for letters of introduction to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he should find any followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. As Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the sky flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? he asked. I am Jesus whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. The men who were travelling with Saul had stopped, not saying a word. They heard the voice but could not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground and opened his eyes, but he could not see a thing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he was not able to see, and during that time he did not eat or drink anything. Amen. Let us again pray. O Lord our God, we give you thanks for the gospel of Christ, for the good news he gave to the world of your justice and love and compassion. We thank you for the hope which we have of your kingdom and for the privilege that is ours in being part of Christ's body, the church. For all the friendship and encouragement that we have found within the church's fellowship, for the presence of the Holy Spirit acting in our lives, sometimes in spite of our obstructiveness, for the joys of home and family and the excitement of life today, we give praise and thanks to you who have planned and given us all things. Heavenly Father, we bring you in prayer the needs of the whole Church of Christ around the world. Help her to hold out to your people the way of faith in all the changes and confusions of our age. To all who guide and serve the Church, grant the humility and love without which no work can be done for Christ. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the members of her governments at Westminster and Holyrood, that your wisdom may guide them in their policies and their decisions. And we pray for the peace of the world, that it may be a true peace, inspired by the sense of brotherhood within the human family. Draw us nearer to the day when all the nations will cooperate against disease and prejudice and hunger. Lord, be with all suffering people, the ill, the anxious, the bereaved. And uphold those known to us whose needs we lay before you now. May your love and your peace reach through to them, even when we feel powerless to help. And may the example of Christ's suffering and the knowledge of his understanding be a constant inspiration to them all. All our prayers we bring before you in Jesus' name, our crucified and risen Saviour, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing now the hymn 702, Lord in Love and Perfect Wisdom.
Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. A voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, sir? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up and go into the city and you will be told what you have to do. The last time we encountered Saul was at the stoning of Stephen. He didn't actually take part actively, but he was present observing that all that was happening. You may say that he participated in a passive way because he actually looked after the garments of those who were throwing the stones and the boulders upon Stephen. I suggested at that time that the example of, G of Stephen must have made an impression upon Saul, particularly the way in which Stephen was ready to forgive his persecutors. That thought may well have haunted him for a long time. But Saul was determined to get rid of the Christians. He went to the high priest in Jerusalem and asked for letters to authorize him to arrest Christians that he found in Damascus. He set off on his journey. He was accompanied by officials of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, and I may say that court had jurisdiction over Jews, not just in Jerusalem, but anywhere they were to be found. They were, if you like, the temple police. They accompanied Saul, but they would stay apart from him. Saul was a Pharisee, and that meant he had a very strict attitude in his Jewish religion, and it meant he had to remain apart from others. So he journeyed alone. The distance from Jerusalem to Damascus is 140 miles. The journey had to be made in foot, and it would take the best part of a week. So we can picture Saul journeying alone with his thoughts. I wonder if, as he travelled through the Galilee region, his thoughts turned to Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. They would come to Mount Hermon, a very high mountain in the north of the country, and the road wound its way up there, and once they reached a certain height, they would have a wonderful view over Damascus below, its white buildings against the green of the plain. And down they came to that plain. Now the plain had very hot air, and at the top of Mount Hermon there would be cold air, and when the two mixed, it created electrical storms. So there was a burst of thunder and a flash of lightning, and Saul was thrown to his feet. He heard the voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And in asking who it was, he was given the answer, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now Saul had a religious experience. He had an experience of meeting the risen Jesus for himself. I have speculated that he had thoughts on the way in which Stephen forgave his persecutors, and that may have influenced him eventually to become a Christian himself. But there is no doubt that his encounter with the risen Jesus was the thing that finally converted him. His experience meant everything to him, and it was what drove Saul, or we, as we now know him, the Apostle Paul's ministry thereafter. A religious experience is important, but it can take varying forms. Very few of us will have the kind of experience that Saul had. But it is possible that we have an experience as we worship in church. Particularly as we celebrate communion, we may feel God near to us and very real. But it can happen in other ways too. Perhaps we have some dilemma, some important decision that we have to make and we're not sure in which direction to turn. We pray about it. And eventually it becomes clear. And in that moment, we've experienced God's guidance. Sometimes we're going through a difficult time and we may sense a presence with us. 
something unmistakable, and yet we can't quite put our finger on it. The presence of God, the presence of the risen Christ. Or it may simply be that we receive the strength that enables us to go on. Either way, it is the hand of God, it is the religious experience, and that's what counts. When we encounter non-Christians, maybe atheists, maybe agnostics, they may argue with us about the existence of God. They put the case against God, we put the case in his favour. And in most occasions like that, nobody really wins. But what is unanswerable is our own personal religious experience. We know it to be true, and nothing anybody else can say can counter it. So religious experience is important. It won't necessarily be as dramatic as Saul's, but whatever form it takes, it is valid. The next thing we notice in the story is that the voice said to Saul, why do you persecute me? And then later, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul never actually persecuted Jesus. He was not present at the crucifixion. He did not hammer the nails into Jesus' hand. He did not stand at the foot of the cross and jeer at him. And yet Jesus says, you are persecuting me. You see, Jesus had identified with the Christians who were being persecuted. And anything Saul did to harm these Christians, Saul was doing against Jesus. There comes to mind the parable which Jesus told about the sheep and the goats. And you will remember the sheep and the goats were separated and those who were commended were those who had fed Jesus when he was hungry, given him a drink when he was thirsty, clothed him when he was naked, visited him when he was sick or in prison, done good to him when he was in need. And those who were commended asked when on earth they had seen Jesus. And he said, anything you do for these, my brothers, however humble, you do for me. So doing something positive for other people is doing something positive for Jesus. What we find in this passage about Saul persecuting the Christians is the reverse of that. Anything negative that we do for other people is something negative done to Jesus. Any harm we do to others is harm done to Jesus. And so there is a challenge here to us to make sure that in our relationships with other people, we don't do them any harm, for otherwise it ends up being harm to Jesus. It is, if you like, a call to be consistent in our behavior. In church, we praise Jesus. When we go out into the world, our behavior has to be consistent with that praise. In the prayers of the church, we may claim that we love Jesus. If that love is genuine, we need to show it when we are out there in the world. We need to show our love for Jesus by the love that we show to other people. For our third and final point, we note that Saul was told, go into the city and there you will be told what you have to do. Up until now, Saul had been doing exactly what he wanted. He believed it was appropriate to persecute Christians. He was ardent in his Jewish faith, and he saw these Jews who had become Christians as heretics, and he thought it was right to stamp out this new version of Judaism. All through his life, Saul had done what he wanted. But now suddenly, when he had become a Christian, it was important for him to do what he was told, to do God's will. 
The lines in the Lord's Prayer are particularly important. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But they are extremely difficult lines to pray. Most of us really mean thy will be changed. May my own will be done. Jesus wrestled with this in the Garden of Gethsemane when he faced the suffering of the cross the following day. And he prayed, Abba, Father, take this cup away from me. He didn't want to suffer. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. It is extremely difficult to do God's will. But that is what Saul was called upon to do. And that is what we are called upon to do as Christians, we must perform God's will. We must put God before self. We must put other people before self. Self comes last. It's difficult because we have built into us an instinct to fulfill our own wishes. I suppose it goes back to primitive times when it was the desire to survive And one had to look after one's own interests in order to survive. But that persists in us today. And we must resist it as far as possible and do the will of God. I suggested last week that our passage then answered the question, what is a Christian? A Christian believes certain things and the Christian serves Christ and his church. We have further answers today. The Christian is the person who has a religious experience. The Christian is the person whose behavior in daily life is consistent with his or her worship in church. But above all, the Christian is the person who seeks to do the will of God. Amen. Our closing hymn today is 533 Will you come and follow me? grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. 
Amen.